Hello, everybody. It's lovely to see everybody here. Ooh, sorry, shouting into the microphone. It's lovely to see everybody here. My name is Alistair. I'm here from Periscopics, and I'm going to talk a little bit about AdWords Display, so particularly the GDN. So GDN, the Google Display Network, is the, uh, the kind of the whole array of sites on which Google are going to be willing to show your display ads, which can be text, image, rich media, a whole you know, variety of different kinds of stuff. And so in particular, we're going to look at sort of some of the concepts, some of the principles, and the kind of the overarching strategies that you're going to need to start thinking about sort of before you actually put a campaign together and with some ideas of, okay, when it's running, with this stuff in mind, what, what do I need to do to actually make it work better? Can I just see a quick show of hands to people who are currently using AdWords at all? That's pretty much everybody. And who's using the Google Display Network within that? Okay, it's probably about a third of people. So we're talking about probably some people who are looking to actually develop the strategy for a campaign, some people are looking to actually try and improve the campaign. So the Google Display Network is made up of a huge range of, I guess, what Google call their partner sites, which is basically anybody that signs up to the AdSense program to be able to show ads on their blog, their forum, their website, etc. But also some, some larger publishers that Google does deals with directly. So what you'll tend to find is that on the really kind of smaller niche sites who depend on AdSense a lot for their revenue, you'll get really good placements, okay? Very high quality. You'll get banners right up at the top. You'll get it, you know, integrated in with the content. And on the, the bigger partner sites, particularly news websites, they'd much rather sell that space directly. So the Google Display Network tends to have the poorer quality placements. You'll get an awful lot of impressions on your ads, but generally they'll be down at the bottom of the page a lot more below the fold. You're not going to be seen quite so often. So Google's own sites fit within the Google Display Network, so you can start you know, getting your ads onto things like Maps and Google Finance and so on. And this is all kind of underpinned by their DoubleClick technology stack, which means that DoubleClick is not just their own partner sites, but also a huge range of other sites that all carry that DoubleClick cookie that means it stores that information about the user on their computer so that you can then target that person based on their browsing activity across, frankly, most of the internet. Text ads on websites, image ads on websites, that is a huge bulk of what you're actually going to get. But you can also use video ads. Okay, So if you've got YouTube videos, you can use them as adverts. So think about typical TV-style ad content, you know, 20, 30-second segments. And mobile. Obviously, mobile is a huge push for Google at the moment. They're going really, really hard trying to uh, convince advertisers of the benefit of mobile. The Google Display Network has a variety of different ad formats for mobiles. So things like not allowing flash, slightly smaller sizes that are more appropriate for a mobile screen. Okay? This, this is a set of Google stats. Okay? So take these with a pinch of salt. This is what they're going to use to try and tell you how amazing their Google Display Network is. This is the impact that it's going to have on your web presence overall because it's very, very hard to track. Okay? You can't launch a display campaign and say, this is the impact of my display campaign on my website generally because there's so much kind of other material, so many other effects that is going on within the user's behavior that you can't control for. So Google have tried to do the research themselves, and these are their stats. Take from it what you will, but they're basically going to say that you know, a company that runs a display campaign sees a 24% lift in searches, but they haven't told us, well, how big a display campaign is that? Is that a huge scale, really aggressive thing, or is that a small niche targeted campaign? So these are some nice numbers, but really you've got to go from what you see on your own sites when you start running these campaigns. There are a lot of targeting methods on the display network, more than on almost any other display advertising network that you're going to find. Okay? It is very, very impressive. It is the key strength of the Google Display Network compared to other display, more traditional display. The first targeting method that you can use are keywords. Okay? You can literally just choose keywords on websites where those appear, you're eligible to enter the auction to show your ads. Fantastic. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. There's nothing complex about it. Building and maintaining your keyword lists is it's quite a labor in terms of actually optimizing what is and isn't working, which keywords are getting me onto what sites. But at the end of the day, it's a very easily understandable way to target your ads to the content of websites. Next is, I guess, the more traditional one, the one most people are most f familiar with, which is placement targeting. Choosing websites 
or parts of websites or even individual pages to say, I want my ads to appear here. So within traditional image advertising, you might say, okay, people on website A are my key demographic, therefore I want my ads to appear to anybody on website A or the category of website A. Nowadays, this is also used a bit more granular, particularly for video campaigns. So for example, if you've got a YouTube ad and you want it to appear as a pre-roll in a very, very specific video, you think anyone watching that is absolute gold for me, you can choose the URL of that video on YouTube and say, that's where I want my ad to appear. Topic targeting. Now, this is where we start getting into Google's semantic understanding of, um, of what websites are really containing. Okay? They've started trying to semantically index these websites for quite a long time, and they're starting to get more sophisticated. So based purely, as soon as page loads, they will read, and so when the page loads, that page will say to you know, to Google, give me an ad that's appropriate. Google server reads the content of the page and says, this page is about this theme. And it's very similar to what they do with, say, Google News. I don't know if anyone's really sort of used Google News very much, where they start bundling stories together under just one headline, saying, I think these are all about this. They're pretty accurate. If they say, this page on this website is about buying cars, you can be reasonably sure that that is about buying cars. And what you can do is you can literally browse a master list of topics and say, anything within this topic, I want my ad to show. So the positive side of that is it's very, very easy to set up. It takes a lot less time than trying to put together long lists of keywords or long lists of placements to say exactly where you want to be. The downside is they're very broad in comparison. So let's say that you are a company selling shoes. When you're targeting keywords, it's easy for you to say, okay, show me, so this ad that's got a pair of, you know, red high heels in it, show me on pages about red high heels. When you go to topics, you don't get that granularity. It's easier to set up, but really, you're going to go as far as shoes. Maybe women's shoes. That's about it. On a very similar note, but very different performance, you can actually get interest category targeting. Interests are Google's version of behavioral targeting. This is where they start to say, okay, this person has a history of viewing pages about this topic. So you get exactly the same topics list as you did when you were choosing topics, but suddenly you can say, have they visited multiple pages about this in recent history? Now, what that boundary is for multiple pages, we don't know, and we also don't know how recent is recent. In reality, it's probably a mix. So the more pages they visit, the longer timeline you're going to be allowed to use. You don't get to specify this stuff. Google are going to choose it. But for example, if you're a holiday company, then you can say anyone who has browsed a lot of pages about skiing recently, that's my target. I want to show them an ad for our skiing holidays. The advantage over topic targeting is that with topics, if someone's reading that page, you think, great, they're on this page now. They're reading it, but I have no idea if they've stumbled across it, if they're really actually persistently interested. Interest category targeting solves that problem. If someone is falling into that interest due to their browsing around the internet, their history, they are definitely, definitely interested in this subject because they've looked at more than one, more than two, but a whole bunch of pages about this. So in that regard, it can work very well. The downside is it's actually quite removed from that actual point of interest. So for example, at home, I share a computer with my girlfriend. So I start seeing ads for the kinds of categories of stuff she's interested in. That means nothing to me. The, I see ads for the X Factor all the time. This is not really my area of expertise. But they can be quite cheap to run, and you can start you know, using them in conjunction with other targeting methods to sort of improve that performance and remove some of that gap. Remarketing is the one that I'm hoping everyone is actually most familiar with. You know, most marketing has been sort of trying to push this way for the last sort of year or two now. The, the basic principle for anyone that isn't familiar with it is that users who have been to your site can be targeted as they browse the rest of the web. And you can do that in very sophisticated ways. So you can start saying users who have added something to their basket but not completed the purchase. And you can target them with ads for that particular product. Or you can start saying, right, a week after the, we're going to start showing them a slightly different product that may be slightly cheaper or a product that is the best seller in the same category as the one they looked at, and those sorts of things. 
Google will let you do this. You need to have 100 users in your list of people who visited your site or your part of your site, and then, bam, show them ads. You have to be quite careful, because this is the most creepy of all the display advertising that you're going to get. You will seem like you're getting followed around by remarketing ads. And as an advertiser, it's up to you to not let that happen. Okay? So what you can do is you can apply a frequency cap. You can say, I don't want anyone to see my ads more than X times per day, per week, per month. You can start putting time limits on things. You can say, right, for the first two days after they left my site, I'm going to target them really hard. And the next five days, I'm going to be a bit more gentle. If you have lower bids, you'll show less often and you won't seem quite as pervasive. This is brand new. Okay, this has only been out available to the public for a very short amount of time, and you need to have a very, very high volume re set of remarketing lists to do this. But if you do, it's fantastic. So the way that similar user targeting works is that Google will analyze your remarketing list and the users in it, and they will look at exactly which interest categories they generally browse. It will then automatically target that mix of categories for you. So you're targeting people who have very, very similar browsing patterns to the people who have been on your site. So it might be that they've um, looked at a lot of your competitors. It might be they, that, for example, if you're selling your skiing holidays, they haven't been to your site yet, but they look at all the same forums, all the same gear review sites, etc., as people who have browsed your site. This is a fantastic prospecting tool, a brilliant way to expand your scope and find more users who you can be fairly confident are of some good quality. Of course, you have to ask why they didn't find your site in the first place. What was it about them or about your marketing that didn't let them find you initially? But that's a question to sort of ask yourselves. And finally, search companion marketing. So search companion marketing, this is still in beta with Google. Okay, So you'll need to actually talk to somebody at Google about being able to get this set up. It will be released to the public at some point soon. This is Google's version of search retargeting. So when someone lands on any site within the Google Display Network or within any of the double-click networks, Google can check the referrer for that page view. So what page were they looking at before? If that is coming from a search engine, they'll pull the keyword. So they can start building up a list of keywords that the users have searched for, even if they, whether or not they searched it on Google. Okay? And that list will start building up within the cookie on their computer, and you can target people with those keywords on the display network. So as people browse around, you can start saying, okay, but I know that you have recently searched for this keyword. So you can start targeting your display ads the same way that you target search really niche, granular queries. And, so, and you can start saying, keyword A, its conversion rate is twice as much as keyword B, bid twice as much, et cetera, and really start pushing as much of your marketing as possible through the really kind of niche, high-value channels. The beauty of the Google Display Network and where it really comes into its own is that you can combine these together. Okay? You can start saying, within a single ad group, so with one set of ads, I want to target people who have viewed target one or target two, or instead, who have viewed target one and target two. People that match more than one of these targets at the same time, they are your best prospects that you're going to find through the display network. So for example, a very typical combination would be keywords and remarketing. So you can start saying, I would like to target anyone who is viewing a page that contains these keywords and has been to my site before. Because general remarketing, Okay, it worked quite well. The numbers back it up. But an awful lot of the time, you're spewing out your ads to people who are not interested right now. Yeah, I was looking at this in my lunch break, but I'm working now. They just have... You'll uh, your find them at the wrong time, even if they're the right people. You add in some keywords and say, actually, I only want to show to these people who are matching both of these targets at the same time. And you know you're finding the right people back when they're browsing the right kind of sites. And you can combine any of these marketing these targeting methods together in any way. So there's all these different targets and you can put one, two, three, four, five, six of these all together and start finding lots of very granular little areas and saying, those are the people I'm interested in. And that's where display really starts to behave like search and you can get you know, the really good sort of CPAs by find, putting together lots of very granular targets instead of a few broad ones. 
the quality of the people that you're going to find is better. So as well as keywords and remarketing, typical ones might be interest categories and topics at the same time. So if someone has an interest category for, you know, going back to skiing holidays, we know they've browsed stuff about skiing a lot recently. Well, that's fine. But if we just target that interest category, then they could be looking at anything right now. Okay. If we find topics, then yeah, we'll get people looking at skiing stuff right now, but we have no idea really how interested they are. Put the two together, find only people who match both. They are on a skiing page right now, and they have a history of viewing stuff about skiing, and suddenly you've got a really high quality person. Your target narrows down to very, very small numbers of people when you start putting lots of these together. But the quality goes up, and that's what you're interested in from a modern display campaign. As well as combining these together, you can use these to exclude from each other. So you can say, actually, anyone with these keywords, but anyone who's visited my site before, I don't want to show them ads. I'm prospecting. I'm looking for new acquisitions here. So for example, if your remarketing list were a two-year list of anyone who's ever bought anything from you, so anyone who's viewed your confirmation page, they're an existing customer. You don't need to be spending and targeting with the same CPAs for your new business acquisition. Exclude those users. And, and target only people who haven't purchased from you before. And you can start saying, okay, well now I can distinguish between the CPAs for my new customers and the CPAs for people who have purchased before. You can take your remarketing list and say, All right, I'm gonna build up that remarketing list, I'm gonna do nothing with it, but then every, you know, four times a year, every time I have a sale, I'm gonna turn that on, target that remarketing list really, really hard with my sale message for a period of a week, and then turn it back off again. People who you know are more likely to be enticed, enhanced by the, the promotions that you've got. The Google Display Network will take a huge variety of ad formats. The most common which are text and image ads. That's 80, 90, or maybe more percent of what you're actually going to see, and probably nearly 100% of what you're actually going to do. We will always recommend you use both of these when you set up any campaign. If you set up a text-only campaign, your reach will be huge. Every site within Google's Display Network can choose exactly which ad formats they want to show. And they can say, we want to show image ads, or we want to show video ads, or we want to show flash ads. They cannot opt out of text ads. So text ads have a very high reach. The way Google's auction works is that within a single ad block, they can typically get three text ads or one image ad. So if, you're, if you've got an image ad and you want to show in that ad block, you've got to persuade Google they're going to make more money from you than from all three, you know, showing three different text ads that give the users a choice of which to click on. So realistically, you're going to have to be pretty aggressive with your image ads to get anywhere near the reach you can get on text. Use both. Your text ads, you'll get a lot of reach. Your click-through rate will be rock bottom. That's not always a bad thing. I'm not going to say it's a good thing, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. But you are going to need the image ads for the ones that actually grab people's attention. You can use rich media versions, so you know, animated GIFs, etc. Probably don't. There are a few occasions where you'll get some real benefits from that, but most of the time, the most common types of rich media ads that you're going to see aren't really very innovative. It's just a few slides. It's a way to try and show someone three or four image ads in a row. But unfortunately, what happens is people scroll. They're not going to be sitting there staring at your ad, waiting, oh, this is going to change in a minute. Hang on. Oh, yeah, that was brilliant. That isn't going to happen. They're just going to look and scroll past it. And if the wrong, Im the wrong image, the wrong call to action is showing at the, the time when they see it, you've lost it. Make a traditional image ad and make sure it's good. Flash ads, you're not going to get on any mobile device nowadays with flash ads. It, it, the ad quality is still very good if they're really well made but your reach will decrease and decrease and decrease. It's generally nowadays not worth pursuing that option. Okay. Dynamic remarketing, dynamic contextual ads. These are done, you build these using Google's own templates. Okay. You don't get an awful lot of control. A template builder is okay. It will link in with your Google Merchant Center feed if you have one. Okay. Can I just see a show of hands for anyone that has a Google Shopping set up? Just a few people. If you have a Google Merchant Center feed, set up your dynamic remarketing, dynamic contextual ads. Google will, for the remarketing, look at exactly which pages the person visited, compare that to the URLs in your feed, and show the product image, price, and title in the ad. 
exactly that was previously available only from you know third party companies who would do that specifically people like Criteo, Struck, My Things, etc. With Google System, it will just plug into your existing merchant center feed. Problem solved. Cost per click pricing really really easy. Dynamic contextual. Google will set up exactly the same way they do now with product listing ads and Google Shopping. They will scan the keywords in your list that is matched against the page and so then compare that against your feed and try and choose appropriate products to show. So you can start showing product images in your ad that are, you know, over time optimized for the ones that are going to give the best potential click-throughs. So you can actually start saying... I'm going to showcase these products to these people based on exactly what they're looking at right now. It works really, really well. There's one I haven't included on here, which is brand new. It's not really very widely available yet, and those are Google engagement ads. Engagement ads are more traditional ad formats that haven't typically been available on things like the GDN, which is, you know, sort of roll over and actually do something on the ad. Okay, engage with the ad before you click it and go to the site. The pricing for that is a bit different because the assumption is as soon as you engage with the ad, then you know, you're bought in to that principle. So instead of being charged per click, you'll be charged after a certain minimum threshold of time for engagement with that ad. When you're trying to make ads on the Google Display Network, and I'm talking about image ads here because that's what's actually going to drive most of your clicks, there's just some really, really simple things to keep in mind. Nothing here is... Um, outrageous or something that you can't just think of when you sit down and say, how do I make a good ad? But you would be astonished how often it just doesn't happen. Okay, The amount of ads that we see that are just bland, just very branding driven, they have nothing to differentiate them between the competitors. On an image ad, it's, it's very easy to say, I've got a thousand rules of things I want to include, and you start putting in more and more stuff, and it turns into basically just a block full of text. Don't let yourself do it. You are allowed one message maximum, nothing else. Don't try and get in all the amazing things that make you brilliant. You get to choose one. That should be integrated with your call to action. If your message is, we have the best experts in the industry, then your call to action is, call now to speak to the best experts in the industry. It's, you, it gets integrated. You don't get the space for an yet another sentence for your call to action. Your call to action is what they're going to do when they reach your site. What is the end goal of them actually coming to you and reading all of your stuff and finding out what's going on? It is not click here. Okay, That's not a call to action. The imagery has to be good and it has to be relevant. You cannot have the same set of images across your entire display campaign. Okay? If you're selling shoes and you've got your, you know, a really nice set of targets for sort of women's fashion shoes, nice set of targets for trainers, nice set of targets for men's smart and men's casual, they have to be relevant to each of the targets you actually come up with. Otherwise, there is no point having separate targets. You are going to need to create a lot of good quality imagery and it must be good. If you buy the bland stock photos to try and make your image ads, you won't get clicked. It just won't happen. If you've got some faceless, cartoon-esque characters sitting around a table shaking hands, it, you've completely wasted your time. This one seems obvious, um, and I'm a bit disappointed that I actually have to say it. Include your brand. There is a nice sort of halo effect from display advertising. People are going to see it. They won't necessarily click it but your brand is in their consciousness. So don't force them to click through to your site to find out who you are. You occasionally see ads that sort of try that as a gimmick and sometimes ads that just haven't thought about it and literally it's just an image, a piece of text. Take the advantage of it. A lot of people are going to see your ads. With a really good display campaign, a lot of really relevant people are going to see your ads. Get your brand in there. If you're doing anything whoops, remotely product specific, include prices. Unless your prices update so often that you literally cannot update your ads, include your prices. We are paying almost all the time on the Google Display Network on a cost per click basis. If someone is likely to buy at that price, including a price will encourage them to click. 